Good evening, and yeah, I'm very happy to almost in this light see that there are some remainers left in the house. Might be some disruption when more people come up from the performance that's still ongoing downstairs. We'll have to live with that. What moves you is the title of this closing session. It's a question that we have been uh, returning to, uh, keeping returning to in the course of the festival and in the development of this year's festival thematic. With this question, we wanted to refer to an emotional understanding of yeah, being moved by something, a feeling that maybe motivates us to act or maybe simply change our perce perception. But it can also be understood as referring to the material conditions that move us, well, in this way or another. Uh, I think we have explored this uh, question from many different points of view, uh, starting, of course, from the idea of a contemporary structures of feeling in our opening event that had this title also. The anthropologist Stefan Welgraf outlined the present social political conjuncture as one of being characterized by neoliberal precarity on one side and a nostalgic nationalism on the other, and seeing this, of course, also as structurally connected. These notions of structures of feeling, we have heard it perhaps too many times already, but uh, also Velgraf and Coleman re referred to one quote that uh, comes from Williams, and I would just like to say again here, and I quote, uh, structures of feeling then is a kind of an attempt to deal with emergent social formations and experiences, including those at the very edge of semantic availability. In our two working groups, the so-called study circles, we engaged a number of scholars, artists, and activists to look closer at two such formations, uneasy alliances and effective infrastructures. And we have members of those two study circles uh, present in the session here today, complemented also by other speakers. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to address also uh, future practices that can take us out of uh, this conjuncture. So we'll have a double focus in a way. We're discussing concrete projects and practices that relate to this question, but also focusing on new commons in the form of alliances and also infrastructures for action. And for this discussion, we have invited Sumogan Sivanesan to act as your moderator and uh, he has uh, kindly uh, agreed to follow many of the festival events, uh, and he's drawing in reflection on that process. Sumo is an artist, writer, and researcher based here in Berlin, previously a research fellow at the University of Potsdam at the Department of English and American Studies, where he was doing a project following artist activists organizing in the wake of the UN COP21 summit. He has produced products with Momentum, ZKU, Art Laboratory Berlin, the School of Machines, and Black European Body Politics. And he was in 2005 and 6 co-director of Electro Fringe, which was an annual festival for emerging arts and culture in Newcastle, Australia. So I'd like to welcome Sumo and all of the participants in this final session. Okay, thank you, Christopher, for that lovely introduction, and um, also Daphne and all the Transmedia team and everyone here at Hakave for who's involved in keeping this festival going and afloat over this weekend. Um, so this panel has been convened uh, around a group of people involved in some remarkable projects, and I have to admit that I've only begun to engage with many of them over the last few days. So I'd first like to introduce them and then I will provide a little context for our discussion. So, okay, on the far side over there is Carolina Garcia Catano, who was part of the Uneasy Alliances Study Circle for this, uh, for this edition of Transmediata. And she's one of the founders of Dubne, a free software women's cooperative focused on bringing socially useful free software solutions to the third sector since 2005. In 2011, she became involved in the Toma La Plaza, or Take the Square movements, which facilitated the creation of Occupy Wall Street. 
And now based in Berlin, she has become engaged in a decentralized network to support refugees. And they visit Lager, um, the refugee camps in Berlin and Germany, or Germany. Uh, and now she's interested in creating bridges and political awareness between Europe and Africa. Uh, Fernanda Montero, who took part in the in Effective Infrastructure Study Circle, is a Brazilian independent technologist, photographer and digital artist whose research encompasses philosophy, urbanism, neuropsychology, sociology, through the perspective of technopolitics, feminism, and transhumanism. In the last three years, they have contributed to several initiatives regarding gender, ethnicity, and society in Brazil, which include Maria Lab Hackerspace, Infopreta, Vedetas, and Vedetas Autonomous Infrastructure. Uh, Donatella Della Rata is a scholar, writer, performer, curator, and activist specializing in Arab media and cultures. She holds a PhD from the University of Copenhagen, focusing on the politics of Syrian TV drama. She was a postdoctoral fellow at the Annenberg School for Communication at Pennsylvania University and an affiliate for the Berkman, Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Between 2007 and 2013, she managed the Arabic-speaking community for Creative Commons, and she's co-founder and board member of the website Syria Untold that received a Digital Communities Award at Ars Electronica in 2014. She's curated several international art exhibitions and film programs, including Syria Off Frame, a show of more than 140 Syrian artists at the Fondation Chini, in Venice, 2015, and the Syrian New Waves on Contemporary Image Making in Syria, which was in uh, the Eye Museum, Eye Film Museum in Amsterdam in 2017. Um, and Donatella launched her most recent book here yesterday, Shooting a Revolution, Visual Media and Warfare in Syria, um, which I imagine is available in the bookstore. And get probably needs no introduction to a transmedia Skip. audience. Skip. Skip. <laughs> um, okay, we'll skip it then, yeah. shall we? <laughs> okay then, so um, there were, um, I guess to bring some context to this discussion, first of all I wanted to raise two texts that um, have informed the convening of this panel. The first being Bridging the Gap Between Technology and Progressive Politics that uh, Geert and Donatella had published in December last year uh, on NetTime and I think was reposted on Wired and probably some other places. And um, this paper seeks proposals to restore alliances between tech, prog progressive politics and local movements. And they will elaborate on this later on in this panel. Um, another text is From Steel to Skin, uh, which is linked to in the panel description online, I believe. And there was a, a workshop convened around this text on Thursday. And From, Phil, from Steel to Skin is a four-handed raw manifesto by Fernanda and written in conjunction with Nadej, who was here a few days ago but has returned to Mexico. Um, so. Fernanda is um, yeah, from the Vedetas, which I mentioned earlier, and Nadej is involved with Kefir, which is a feminist liberatech co-op. And in this text, they give voice to a feminist server with re reference to Latin America's histories of colonization, slavery, and servitude, shifting the notion of server between service provider towards the idea of mutual aid and with an emphasis on modes of connection that are not inherently about digital networks, but also encompass ancestry, the body, those with limited access to tech, and those who are otherwise offline. Um, I was also very interested to learn that Vedetis refers to an anti-colonial history and um, post-slavery movement in Bahia, and the services that Vedetis offer, such as a collaborative pad and spreadsheet, are named after black historical feminist figures, Antonia 
Antonieta de Barros, the first black female parliamentarian in Brazil, and Evelyn Boyd Granville, an American mathematician, computer programmer, and educator working from the 1950s until the 1980s. So I think there's some strong resonances between what Fernanda does and what um, Carolina will talk about as well. And so I, I want to offer the Commons as an idea that threads through the work of all of tonight's panelists. Um, and it makes me a little bit anxious because as I started to sketch out this text, I would attend a panel or a session where the Commons would become unpacked or problematized in some way. And so to qualify my use of the term, for me, the Commons has to do with a collective custodianship of knowledge and resources. And I use this resource, this term, this word resources, hesitantly, as I would prefer to think in terms of relations, and we might get back to that later. Um, it's also related to processes of, of commoning or decommodification, and indeed for me, decolonization as well. And as was emphasized in the panel Creating Commons, um, convened by Cornelia Solfrank and Felix Stadler on Thursday, arising from the commons is a need to activate the knowledges, the knowledge that are held in common and the forms and infrastructure that have been commoned. And I think this is particularly relevant to, for example, the kinds of books that GET has been involved in producing with the Institute of Network Cultures, which are all free to download. The kinds of free software that Carolina advocates the use of, um, and perhaps even the, the witness videos and activist media that Donatella is concerned with circulating. Um, and at this point, I also want to raise the idea of the undercommons, as put forth by Fred Martin and Stefano Hani, um, which calls attention to the black radical tradition, uh, modes of self-organisation and black sociality, and in turn spotlights the fundamental anti-blackness that constitutes modernity. And this is implicit in the work of Vedetis. And I must also mention um, another substrata of the commons, and that is to be understood as the impro appropriated indigenous lands, labor, and life worlds on which much of our infrastructures is built. Um, and I don't think has been discussed enough in um, the sessions that I've attended. Um, I'm also very grateful to Lou Cornham who was part of the Effective Infrastructure Study Circle, who yesterday drew attention to a warning issued by Lauren Ballant in another text that I know has circulated amongst the participants and organizers, titled The Commons, Infrastructures for Troub Troubling Times. Um, and in this very rich and layered text, which unfortunately I've only read quite hastily, Ballant expresses her, expresses her suspicion about how the Commons concept has been held up as a kind of utopian signifier. And uncontestably positive aim, and this is a quote, that threatens to cover over the, the very complexity and social jockeying and inter interdependence it responds to by delivering a, confir a confirming effective surplus in advance of the life world it is also seeking. So Blant goes on to suggest that the, the, the better power of the commons is to point to a, to a, a way, oh, excuse me. The better power of the commons is to point to a way to view that's broken, to view what is broken in sociality. The difficulty of convening a world con conjointly, and although it is inconvenient and hard, and to offer incitements to imagining a, a livable provisional life. So I offer this as a thought to hold in mind, particularly as we consider alternatives and autonomous infrastructures to the current social media platforms, media service, messaging services that many of us are entangled with. And to briefly return to the idea of infrastructure, Berlant discusses this infrastructure in terms of a glitch, a disruption or a breakdown, a glitch in the matrix of social reproduction, if you like, that foregrounds the mechanisms that might otherwise be invisible and that require repair or replacement. And perhaps in my rather simplistic reading of this text, Blant suggests to me that rather than revive a system that reproduces these forms of dysfunction and relating, 
The glitch presents an opportunity to pursue something else. And Blant here argues for a contemporary, counter-normative political struggle. Okay, so I think on that note, I will invite our first speaker, um, uh, Carolina Garcia, Garcia Catano. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will try to manage with these lights and everything falling down. Uh, I've been part of the Anisi Alliance's study circle, and there we've been dealing with this discomfort, ambiguity, uh, contradictions that we have uh, nowadays. No? And for me, one of the first uh, impulses that came is like being in a framework of the Transmediale and uh, being a reference of the digital culture. Uh, how is it, or how is it, is, uh, has been forgotten the use of free software? No, like uh, nowadays, nobody or almost nobody is referring to free software as a key issue when talking about technology and digital culture. Um, but free software for me is uh, a key uh, issue that we have to address and not forget. No, the term has been run over by the idea of open source used in the startup world. Uh, open source has used or uh, this uh, or misused many of the hacker spirit. Uh, it has distortion make distortions of uh, the values around hackers in the benefit of for profitable of neoliberalism. No, so we name it sometimes the same: open source, free software. But I want to claim the use of free software as the ethical solution and political uh, responsibility uh, when we talk about uh, technology. But also free software for me is not just about technology. It has been a new model of how to do politics. It has introduced as a political concept networks, uh, a way of es esca escalation that goes through decentralization, has become a collaborative and cooperation and brings empowerment to people and sovereignty in the use of technology as uh, the way that is uh, as a possibility to shape or giving the possibility to shape the future of society because one thing that we cannot escape is that technology is going to shape it. So also uh, with uh, free software, it open to other fields, no? like to the fields of knowledge, uh, cultural knowledge, through the licenses uh, like copyleft, Creative Commons, and so many other free licenses that are there. And also around it started to be shaped the idea of commons, as uh, Sumu was saying. That for me is a bridge and a recognition of former ways of doing in indigenous communities or before neoliberalism and capitalism was set up as the normal way of doing things with the current needs or uh, challenges around technology. Also, internet has brought many new paradigms, like there is no intermediaries, there is a peer-to-peer -peer communication, and around it, uh, it has grown a lot of, yes, uh, collaborative ways of doing. No, and producing knowledge and software, but also activism. I want to remember that already in 1994, the Zapatist movement in Mexico was using internet to uh, bring together at a global level the action to support Zapatism and indigenous uh, communities. It, has <clears throat> it, it worked already with net art. It used already autonomous servers and brought the, the notion of hacktivism from which many of us have learned and uh, actually became our way of living, that thing that moves us, or at least it moves me. No? But from there we can also see the impact that technologies uh, have had in the last wave of protest of the 2011, 
somehow. Starting in Tagrid, even though it, it not, was not the first step, uh, Tunisia had taken to the streets. Also in Senegal, Yanamar was uh, going out in the streets. But all, as, as well as I can say that online provides a lot of communication and spreads the word and facilitates uh, different ways of uh, engaging to activism and political action and uh, street action, it has the limits that we've been talking also about, like the need of these affections you know, and the need of care. We are living uh, fragmented societies, we are isolated, we are in a individualistic moment, so we need to become together. No? We need to come together, to, we need to overcome fear, and this is happening, uh, let's say, in the streets or in common places where people can meet and share all these uh, practices. And as well as coming together and looking for solutions to our lives that every day are based on <coughs> I'm sorry, social injustices, unsustainable ways of living, this is what is bringing us actually to, to the streets, no? not technology. Sometimes we put too much uh, emotions and say, ah, yes, social networks is bringing people outside. And it's not right. It's just how and what's happening in our current society. But I also want to uh, refer that if I'm saying that free software is giving a framework of how to build technologies, we need to reflect on where do the material, actually the physical material of the technologies that, are te that we are using in a, such a massive way are coming from. And that's where I want to make a really emphasis on thinking about what means colonialism. We are looting all, uh, especially African countries, but we can say the same uh, in South America, etc., uh, for producing these technologies. No? So we are consumers of technologies in, instead of our consumers. We are allowing this to happen. We are provoking uh, a lot of uh, suffering through this use, looking away of how and what are our technology is made of. So uh, I think it's time that we stop and check and do something, actually, uh, about where are the natural resources for these te technologies coming, but not only the, the natural resources, but also many of the European policies when coming to regulate what happens in other countries. We are seeing now who, uh, who is defining no, the uh, terms like democracy or terrorism or things like this. But at the same time, we are not so much aware that, for example, France with the CFA is issuing the currency of 15 African countries. So 15 African countries are depending directly on the economy of France, which at the same time is taking all the natural resources, which thanks to them, we are having all no, our techno technified uh, life. So um, I think we are direct responsible somehow of what's happening also in the borders. I want to reflect and to remind that thousands of people are dying at the, uh, in the borders of Europe, and many of these uh, causes are regarding uh, to this looting of resources for this comfort uh, society we live in. But even if we are doing this necro necropolitics, I don't want to just go into this depressive direction, which I don't think we have to uh, forget and we have to act. <coughs> But I do think that uh, the new protests that are happening and building these bridges, as uh, Suma was saying, uh, I'm trying to get more involved with African uh, movements to be aware of what's happening there. And actually, I'm uh, discovering that we have many common uh, things. No? And these protests are not giving solutions, I, I would say. It's not like ideologies. We are running away from this one solution for everybody will work, but are building up how to frameworks of how to do things. And there is where inclusiveness and affective and care, non-violent, soft identities are coming into play. No? And for me, it's key that 
This uh, framework also uh, claimed by the feminist movement uh, of care in the big sense plays a big uh, role. And that's why also I'm a great believer that happiness and joy is a way of resistance in a fascist world that we're living. Just I wanted to point out some of the, maybe you all are aware of, but uh, protests that are taking place and also that are bringing these uneasy alliances sometimes, like the Yellow Vest in France, who nobody knows if it's extreme right, extreme left, but the only thing is people are coming together against a situation of abuse of power by the political and financial um, powers since they don't not like since they are bringing all these austerity measures and uh, destruction of welfare state, but also Extin extinction rebellion is talking about the save of the planet and Sudan uh, Sudan uprisings is bringing uh, is challenging the split of a country by the colonial interest because they want to take care of the resources by protesting together against uh, a dictatorship. As positive uh, experiences, I can say in Spain many things are going on. I come from Spain, I don't know if it was mentioned, but Stop Evictions is a network of activists uh, putting their bodies and their affects uh, to defend the people who are evicted by the banks because they cannot pay anymore the mortgage. Um, uh, Parrato is a citizen initiative against the former IMF uh, president that has been now in, uh, in prison thanks to crowdfunding campaign that have supported this initiative and paid the lawyers. Uh, for six years it's been going on and now he's in prison. I also want to remind uh, mothers in Tijuana who are fighting against the feminists and organizing and Due to them, movements like Ni Una Menos and all the feminist and uh, women's strike is uh, happening. There is a network of networks, Solidarity Economy, uh, rep uh, called Repress Europe, that is working also in these solutions, the squatting movement, bringing spaces, the squatting spaces, spaces and bringing uh, self-organized um, um, practices into uh, practice. So I think that Actually, we have a lot uh, to think about. There are a lot of solutions already out there. We have to look for them and uh, escape a bit also this uh, intentional creation of fear and depression framework, which all this mass media wants to bring us into. And I believe that digital technologies based on free software uh, will help, but actually we need to come together physically to think about how we want to continue in these alternatives. So I would pass. Now I will finish and ask again at the end. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe to pick up on the notion of uh, building bridges and bridging the gap. Pass over to Donatella and Get. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'll um, give a f quick update, and, and then we go into the, the different uh, topics and um, uh, issues uh, and strategies that uh, we want to discuss here. Um, over in Amsterdam at the Institute of Network Cultures, uh, we've been very much uh, still working on topic of last year's uh, Transmediala that was really discussed here uh, uh, concerning blockchain and uh, Bitcoin and um, um, the de debates over um, universal basic income, the Money Lab um, thing. We have a Money Lab uh, event coming up for the first time in Germany, um, in, um, uh, in Siegen, uh, and that's 7 of 8 of uh, March. So we're really excited about that to um, go there um, further into these um, uh, topics that do not uh, go uh, away. In fact, uh, they're really, really uh, urgent um, if we look at uh, the mass uh, precarity. So the, the question of how uh, artists are going to make a living 
Um, and that this is our special concern. It's really high on our agenda. Same uh, already mentioned, um, our digital publishing uh, experiments. Uh, also there, we have an international two-day event. We're doing that together with Florian Kramer in Rotterdam and uh, Nishan Shah in Arnhem. Um, and that's in, uh, in May, on um, uh, 17th, 18th of May. Uh, we, we're having um, uh, uh, an alternative publishing summit in Arnhem. Uh, the Netherlands, close to the German border, and it's called Urgent Publishing. And Urgent Publishing asked uh, the question uh, that uh, was also mentioned here already, how we can speed up uh, really relevant um, uh, scholarly, activist, artistic work and uh, bring that into circulation so that the work that is being done or that is presented, for instance, here at Transmediale uh, can have uh, an, an impact, of course, without losing uh, the, the quality, because uh, speeding up uh, is, of course, not um, um, something that is good in itself. Uh, but nonetheless, we think that our um, knowledge uh, that uh, you know, presents here needs to uh, circulate more and needs to circulate faster. The question is, how do we do that? How can we go beyond the traditional uh, methods um, uh, of, um, let's say, scholarly publishing or, um, or trade fair uh, publishing? Um, my own work, uh, I'm still very much um, concerned with uh, the social media uh, critique and the question that uh, was mentioned here, um, uh, you know, the, the question of the alternatives for um, the social media beyond, uh, let's say, only uh, complaining uh, about uh, the monopolies of uh, Facebook and Google. And I'm really glad you, you mentioned um, uh, the importance of, um, of free software. Uh, and I'm, I'm, we're going to uh, go into that a, uh, a little bit um, uh, later. Um, last but not least, um, I myself have been de re dealing really uh, intensely with this uh, social media reality. And um, maybe you've seen it. I, I recently published a, a text called Sad by Design, in, in which I'm going uh, into this question of the, uh, the melancholy that is being, in, in fact, produced uh, by these uh, tech companies. Um, then we go to the text, uh, which Donatella and I uh, wrote um, a couple of months ago, um, published on uh, NetTime and elsewhere in December. Um, and uh, it's called Bridging the Gap uh, Between Technology and Progressive Politics in Europe. All right. Um, thank you for having us today. And I really love the question that you're asking. What moves you? It's a very, very relevant question. And I have to say, talking about the text that we authored, uh, actually in Berlin, this is where we started thinking about this text, that, in fact, uh, as Carolina pointed out, uh, joy should be put uh, in the first place. I mean, I think we did author this text because we are both, uh, well, we are friends, uh, first of all. We enjoy working together and we wanted to uh, raise something for, for, you know, helping us and other people to find a, a constructive solution to this problem. So it's not that we want to raise just the dark sides of the networks, but we want to find joy in this uh, kind of like uh, very troubled times, as Carolina underlined. So I very much share what she, she said about joy and happiness. Um, we have just like put on the slide some relevant uh, parts of the text. The text is divided in uh, different subsections. I want to touch upon this first one, which is like, uh, well, the, the problem whether, you know, uh, activism has been going through, especially in the past uh, decades, which is, you know, whether you choose to be active at a cosmopolitan, global, immaterial level or at the local grassroots level. And, of course, it's not never a either or or situation. However, we are human beings, right? So we have limited amount of hours to live and be active with. Um, I also, I'm also happy that uh, she mentioned the uh, free software because this is where, you know, I, I used to be the, the manager, like the, the head of like community 
um, Arabic speaking community for Creative Commons. So I did a lot of activism on behalf of Creative Commons and there was an overlap in the Middle East uh, prior to the uprisings uh, with the free software movement, with the open source communities also. And so we used to get together and think a lot. I think actually one of the, like free software movement, it's probably one of the main problem. It's exactly what is up in the slide. Probably the free software movement has been acting maybe too much emphasizing the cosmopolitan global level versus the local. Because I realized also when I went back to my own country, which is Italy, that you know the free software movement and also the open source one, which is more active because it's more connected to business uh, uh, stuff and startups, uh, was completely dead. Uh, unlike in the Middle East, but in the Middle East, uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, they felt Arab communities, Arab geeks, Arab techies, Arab bloggers, they did feel the urgency of having free software and open source software as, as an alternative to proprietary software, which was, of course, too expensive for them, you know? So it was like uh, something not just fashionable because, oh, I like to wear the Linux uh, pin, uh, you know, because I like, yeah, to be connected to Silicon, Silicon Valley techies, which is part of the problem, by the way. I don't want to deny it because I saw it happening also in the Middle East. However, I do think that there was this urgency at the grassroots level in the Middle East to really use the software, I mean, the free software. It was useful, okay? So this is why it was rooted in the local. Uh, as opposite to my, my, my country, you know, I, I used to work on Linux and at some point I, I got completely uh, disappointed and desperate because there were no local communities. So yes, I could talk to the global yeah, Silicon Valley crowd or not, not just Silicon Valley, but global crowd. But there was no, nothing at the grassroots level because simply it was not felt you know, a, as a need as much as it was felt in the Middle East. So I think free software is also probably a good example and a sad example because probably tied up too much with the local, sorry, the global level versus the local level. Uh, but I want to talk about an experience that uh, it's very local, it's very new, um, and I would like to share it with you because I'm really fascinated by the work that these people are doing. Um, there is a group of people uh, in Rome, in my, my city, called the HER, Human Ecosystem Relazioni. Uh, the leading people behind this group are uh, um, Salvatore Iagonesi and Oriana Persico. Uh, Salvatore Iagonesi is a, a famous, quite famous uh, uh, open source engineer and artist uh, uh, who has been developing a platform called Art is Open Source, so also for health issues, I mean, including the cancer. It's, uh, and making all the data open source and shareable. Uh, their project, so they went back to Rome and they established this company called, not company, but you know, um, yeah, a, a group called the Human Ecosystem Relazioni. Their focus is very much uh, to study data, algorithms, artificial intelligence at what they call a relational level. So uh, their research question is how to bring back the discussion from extractive data, which is what also we hear so much when we talk about platform capitalism, back to the relational aspects of data, which is quite challenging because it, there is something embedded in ourselves which makes us think that uh, data are ontologically speaking extractive, and so there is no way out. You know, it's a little bit like, uh, yeah, the data realism. That's it. That's what we have. So uh, they are emphasizing, and they use, uh, just to connect also to what uh, um, Sumungan has been raising, like the idea of the commons, they like to put, uh, to, to put the spotlight on, on um, the Ostrom definition of commons, uh, which in fact was made by three uh, kind of subsections. So the commons are not only the resource that we share and we call commons, uh, but also the human relational ecosystem which is surrounding the commons and the rules, the code. So the rules that the community, the relational ecosystem, gives to those who are part of the ecosystem in order to regulate the commons. So they want to put uh, under the spotlight this definition which is not just, let's not focus on the commons as a resource only. So 
defend and, uh, and struggle and fight for the resource. But let's remember that behind the commons, there is an ecosystem of relationship, and this ecosystem needs to be uh, to invent new rules in order to uh, regulate the commons as an ecosystem. So just to bring up their experience, they do a lot of projects, but this is one very interesting project they just did in December in the neighborhood of San Lorenzo, which is a highly problematic neighborhood uh, with lots of problems uh, for you know, drugs. Uh, very recently, there was a, a, a murder happening, uh, being committed against a, a teenager girl. Uh, Salvini, our infamous uh, uh, defense minister, um, came there and it was even applauded by people because, I mean, it was like saying, okay, we're gonna bring up security, you know. So there is a neighborhood where fear has been playing off a lot. So they established this, this uh, Dati di Borgata, I call it. It's like uh, rethinking data and artificial intelligence in a, in a local way, rooted in a local way. So basically what they do is that they host workshops with uh, shopkeepers, uh, kids, uh, school teachers at a very local level uh, to build, uh, for example, an artificial intelligence of the neighborhood. And they start by, I did some uh, ethnography on their method, which is very interesting. I, I do not have time now to explain everything, but if you like, I can explain later on a separate level. And also, I hope there will be a piece up on uh, INC where I will explain extensively the method. But anyway, the main thing is that they put together this very different crowd, which is not just only the techies, the global, the cosmopolitan crowd. So it's just really the shopkeepers, those who sell stuff in the neighborhood. And they hold workshop in which they start uh, thinking about how do we build an artificial intelligence that is, for example, relational. Like, uh, uh, how do we uh, build data that are based on relations? And I, I witnessed that it's very difficult for the people who take part in the workshops to think about, for example, artificial intelligence uh, out of the box uh, that we usually think about, which is uh, artificial intelligence as a service. So we are customers, we need to consume something. Artificial intelligence is a little bit like a slave that should serve our need. So they try to reverse the discourse and the imagination of artificial intelligence by starting asking, how do we build a relation with the artificial intelligence? How do we um, unpack the, the idea of artificial intelligence and that, how do we hack into the idea of artificial intelligence, because of course we're not gonna learn anything about the artificial intelligence behind Facebook, because Facebook is not gonna let us. But if we build our own neighborhood, local artificial intelligence, then the source can be open source. The code can be seen by everybody, right? So this is the models that they are implementing in the San Lorenzo neighborhood. And because it was quite successful, they are now uh, reply, uh, copying it in another neighborhood, which has a very high uh, number of percentage of uh, people living there who are coming from uh, different cultures, a lot of Muslims, you know, uh, and, and so it's quite a diverse environment. I will leave it to you now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, in the... Uh, peace, of course, we uh, go into the political question uh, of um, 2018, uh, which is, uh, you know, what comes uh, after uh, Facebook uh, and uh, Cambridge and Analytica, because this is what uh, uh, has defined uh, our year, uh, this, uh, the crisis and the numerous uh, scandals uh, uh, which uh, uh, Facebook uh, and uh, being the owner also of uh, uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, um, uh, is being going through, and of course, from a, from a, um, an activist uh, artistic perspective, it's really remarkable uh, that from our side uh, we don't hear much. Right? Um, even you can get regularly everywhere into debates. Yes, I'm still on Facebook. Uh, I need to be there, and so on and so on. Right? There's a complete lack. Uh, of, um, uh, of a sense of urgency uh, to uh, develop 
uh, these, um, these um, alternatives. And we are analyzing uh, in this piece that this is uh, also because of this growing gap between the, the global uh, and the local, right? Because uh, uh, maybe on the local, on the global level, we can make a, a good and uh, perfect uh, uh, analysis of these uh, global companies. But on the local level, if you look at the social movements that are there, uh, they uh, defend themselves and say, we, well, we can only reach the people, the ordinary people, uh, through Facebook, right? So this is, uh, this, and this has been uh, stuck. This, this discussion this, uh, is really uh, uh, is st stagnated. Um, and uh, we at, at the uh, Institute of Network Cultures have a, a project that has been dealing with this since 2011. It's called Unlike Us. And we have seen, yes, uh, of course, in uh, in 18, a rise of, uh, of debates and uh, exchanges and so on. Um, there is, uh, of course, people. some people say, yeah, we should use Signal. Uh, others uh, point at the discussions and the experiments uh, inside the smaller communities uh, that use Mastodon. Uh, so Mastodon is, uh, is yes, a free software uh, initiative. And so, yes, there have been uh, small steps uh, made um, maybe much like uh, in 2011, remember, with, with the diaspora and a few others. But uh, we do not seem to uh, really make um, uh, a substantial uh, uh, breakthrough, right? Also, we are, of course, uh, with, uh, faced with the problem of the, uh, of the exponential growth and that if you want to uh, really uh, reach that critical mass of users, You've got to have an enormous amount of money and grow very fast. This is the whole venture capital logic. If you reject that, then what? Right? And, and, and there, um, the, the discussion uh, over the social media alternatives. And the, um, here you can see a little bit like old school net time uh, kind of collaborative filtering what is happening because, of course, a lot of the stuff uh, is happening on the, on the web. So and this is what uh, the Unlike Us uh, community is doing. We are looking, we're testing uh, and following very, very closely and uh, pushing uh, the alternatives uh, that um, are out there. And now, of course, this is also framed in a wider discussion over the future of the internet uh, infrastructures, right? So we can say, okay, we, you said uh, also free software you know, is important, but people don't use software anymore, they use apps. Yeah? And we can say, well, that's, that's not good, we, you should not use apps, we, yeah? but okay, this is the reality of, uh, of the billions. And um, uh, in, in that reality, if you're looking at the apps, you immediately move to, uh, let's say, Benjamin Bratton's uh, notions of the stack and of all the, the layers of infrastructure uh, that um, are out there. And uh, in Amsterdam, we, in June, we had a big uh, uh, kind of uh, summit, uh, which was focusing, for instance, on uh, f defining a more uh, European definition of that using a term like the public stack. What could be the public stack? What, how can we uh, define a digital commons uh, that goes back again to the infrastructure? And the infrastructure was also something you know, that was discussed here um, uh, at this festival on uh, a number of occasions. So uh, the, the future of uh, the discussion of the, of the uh, internet as a, as a public infrastructure is really out there and we should really push also very much uh, to Brussels to have that on the agenda because we should not accept that the, the social media question gets uh, reduced to data protection, uh, privacy protection and that uh, this problem is only a problem of regulation, right? In very much as, as, uh, here, the, the uh, Bundesregierung and in Brussels, they love to reduce this question to one of regulation, right? And they will be very happy if Facebook will have to pay or Google will have to pay a billion uh, euros. It doesn't really matter as a fine, yeah? But we think this is not the way to go, right? We need to rethink um, uh, our vital communication infrastructures bottom up and we need to come up with uh, alternatives from Europe. Um, I think my 
might because we had our other points, but I think we are like running, yeah? So maybe we'll leave it to the other speakers and then we go back if we have time to more points, right? Okay, thank you, and um, the last speaker is Fernanda Montero. Well, oh, I tried to build some text to, uh, before I speak too much, so. <laughs> uh, so, I think I'm very uh, comfortable to be here right now on this conversation because we are very, all very aligned on uh, the use of open source and shared knowledge, not only like uh, building open source software, but building open source communities, open source uh, assets, open source thinking. <laughs> uh, so I'm not much into talking about uh, um, Initiatives in Brazil, I could talk about half an hour, as I said, Carolina, for uh, we talked about how it will take too much time, but also I uh, want to, to take um, a different approach on how we are building these infrastructures. Um, we had this um, study group on effective infrastructures, and maybe um, it's time also to think about other ways to be connected. So it's more like maybe it will be a little quirky, but <laughs> well, I'm, I'm getting on a point later. Um, so uh, it's pretty difficult um, to not tell about uh, a little of political contest. Um, uh, it's not like that. I'm really proud to say I'm living and basing, based in Brazil right now, but <laughs> uh, it's also um, a question about naming uh, some of the, the location and historical and political situation I'm, I'm involved with. Um, and also, uh, when when it comes to uh, coming to other spaces like being here in Transmetal or being overseas, people used to exotify a lot about uh, what is this experience. And this goes through also the, the use we have been done uh, of technologies like social media sharing in this Facebook, Instagram, way of mind of uh, being always sharing something about us, which is not about the other most of the time. Sometimes it's more, most of the times it's more about what we are doing, what we are eating, what we are thinking, uh, and not actually about uh, ourselves, more about what people expect from ourselves. Uh, I don't think that building uh, alternative infrastructures uh, is dismantling completely this scenario. Um, it's quite impossible. It's not like Google or Facebook would vanish uh, from night to day. Maybe in three years, four years, Facebook goes out. So I hope so. But <laughs> uh, it's still uh, the culture and the way to share uh, among people uh, is still based on this kind of relation. And this is like a personal experience uh, I would like to share about. Uh, I do, actually, I don't like to uh, take pictures when I am in other places uh, than Sao Paulo where I'm based because it also, because it uh, exotifies a lot. Also because I'm quite perfectionist at photography. <laughs> and, but uh, mainly because uh, we can relate of our experiences and being together more uh, by telling to each other what we really did than actually showing pics of it. Uh, and this, I think that uh, it's the affectional use of these technologies that this hegemonic 
infrastructures like, well, there's Google Maps, we can't avoid that. Uh, it has plenty of peaks of Berlin or Sao Paulo or Barcelona or any other place which is pretty invasive, but they are there. And maybe people can relate more if I say, well, I went to Kreisberg. I, I sure I didn't pronounce it right. <laughs> uh, and I felt uh, belonging to uh, you know, see pride flags all around. Uh, this is more relatable. This is more interesting to people make use of these hegemonic infrastructures than rather than uh, looking at a picture for some time and, oh, that people is there. Oh, so fancy. Uh, you know? Uh, and, and this is about affections, like uh, building a collective memory out of things that uh, could be individual in a manner, like in capitalist manners or productivity manners, uh, but they are not. Uh, it's, I think that understanding this, uh, being together and exchanging this information and sharing and having the chance to be asked for some information and also to hear Many, so many other stories is pretty important. Uh, regardless, it's being online or offline, uh, and also it, the act of naming or creating symbols out of this, like the symbol, the symbol of being feminist, uh, the symbol of being a black woman or a non-conformed gender person, or whatever. We, we talk about labels, but we should think about symbols, you know? Uh, like, uh, it's more easy to construct uh, and to relate to each other. And not only, uh, this reminds me of global and local culture because of, I'm reminded of Eric S. Raymond and Cathedral and Bazaar, which is pretty much one of, of the first uh, technical and hacker culture, an open source culture lectures I've done. Um, and that's pretty much like not constructing a global, like in a colonized and universal way of doing things, but uh, maybe uh, building a global made of locals, which is pretty different because it, this is what intersectionally means, intersectionally it means. Uh, so when we, we uh, construct and see the Videtas in Brazil, which, is pro which provides services, uh, but also provides some um, um, common places to discuss digital security and building of trust and safe in digital communications. Uh, we talked about Videtas because it's about, as Sumo said, uh, some histor historical meaning uh, of palafites that black women used to resist under colonial pressure. Um, so, rather than uh, being uh, named or labeled like something, but we could actually appropriate this, con uh, this concept of tagging some things to actually relate it to which places we are comfortable. Uh, and this, uh, this sense of affection, it's what brings us here uh, to Transmetal and also for the, inf for the affective infrastructures to the circle. Uh, I think that even before I was physically here, I was communicating and sharing affections with each other. Uh, and, and also, my, uh, building these symbols also helped me to get along with people, uh, even before the, the stage circle, the stage group. Um, there's a local hacker space here, feminist hacker space called Heart of Code. Uh, I was talking with someone who actually didn't know about Heart of Code. Uh, it was founded like 2000. 16, 2015, uh, pretty closer to where we are, we are sitting in Maria Lab in Sao Paulo. 
Uh, and we had a lot of conversation about what, uh, what was bringing these spaces, these common spaces and comfortable spaces to be together. Um, so just to wrap up, these are the joys of being connected. Uh, even we are, uh, when we are aware that we have different living experiences, uh, living ways to get connected, different ways to be together and to get along with people. Uh, it's not about instrumentalize uh, these affections, but more uh, like a reflection on what do and um, how do we use these infrastructures we all had to have to build more affectionate infrastructures of care and of being together and of uh, physical, mental, social, um, and ever of aspects of engagement. So it's pretty much what, what I was about to say. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we're going to open into a conversation here, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, I don't know if there are microphones out there, but um, I have a question. I mean, in my scribblings here, I've, I've, I've highlighted all these kind. I guess these these kinds of effects that you've been talking about about joy and happiness. Um, gets notion of sad by design, how um, certain kinds of software regimes are, or platform regimes um, do induce certain um, modes, effective responses, um, and interface design as well. I think I, someone was talking about that this morning. Um, and also, uh, I guess this idea of relationality in the commons as well, like how to build infrastructures out of relations rather than um, the provision of services. Um, maybe, and I'm trying to think of a neat way into that, and I think the one thing that maybe Carolina and Fernanda and maybe uh, you get as well might know more about is um, this movement of feminist servers. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about that? <laughs> well, um, when thinking of feminist infrastructures and feminist servers, it's not uh, like just uh, talking about uh, building services out of feminist feminism or being a woman to participate, but also uh, try to uh, equilibrate in this equation of how much these infrastructures are affected by these hegemonies as a well, whole, like uh, technology as being uh, the market as uh, cisgender, men, white people, understand men that, of doing things. Uh, so it's pretty important to decolonize technology and this Silicon Valley feeling of doing technology uh, to engage people, uh, not only women, but non-conformed gender people and other people which could be um, allies to, to this discussion to understand how to construct technologies which actually uh, help us to build virtual safe spaces. Uh, so there are plenty of digital feminist infrastructures right now uh, and also non-digital feminist infrastructures. Uh, I think I, it would be worth mentioning a lot of it, but I, I'm pretty overwhelmed right now. <laughs> but that's it, it's the, the concept. Yes, just to add that one of the concerns also in the free software community has been why is there such a lack of presence of women. And from there, uh, many of these need 
no, that Fernanda was saying comes out. No? We need to be feminist infrastructures because we uh, think of technology in a different way. And we are always uh, having this tension no? in these uh, spaces around technology and the effect that we are seeing also over the years that many women that were involved in uh, technology end up leaving this space, no? end up uh, withdrawing. So somehow comes this need of how do we keep engaged? No? And feminist infrastructures are thinking on that. Um, Gerd, would you like to say something about side by design as well? Uh, no, I, I, first of all, to say something about the, this issue because it's really uh, important. I really want to stress the importance of uh, you know, independent, uh, autonomous, um, technical infrastructure, uh, even beyond uh, software. Um, because, uh, let's say, in the 90s, it was normal uh, to, to have your own servers, and it, they were uh, very widespread. And uh, they've now all but uh, disappeared. And... Um, even in a, in, a, in a community that is uh, preaching everywhere, uh, you know, that uh, there we must work on a decentralized web and so on, which is uh, uh, the, the religious uh, community of uh, Bitcoin and the blockchain, uh, you know, which is uh, really believing in uh, decentralized uh, infrastructures. They are not building actual infrastructure, right? So this is all uh, kind of pseudo decentralized services inside the cloud. Yes, and uh, we should really uh, be uh, be aware of that when we're when we're using uh, these terms because uh, this crisis is a really a, a, a very serious uh, serious one. Uh, so there is a, a really a, a, a stagnation or even a, a regression on the, even on the level of our co uh, collective uh, imagination, and there is even a, a cognitive dissonance because we are uh, talking about decentralization and stressing the need, but there is no actual evidence um, uh, that uh, we are uh, actually moving uh, in another direction. In instead, what we see, and all the statistics uh, uh, prove this, is that there is a further decentralization every year, year by year by year. Uh, there is a further, there's a growing centralization of infrastructures and power um, uh, in, uh, in this field. So that is a really uh, big concern and we need to uh, turn uh, the tide there. Um, sad by design um, uh, is a result of this, uh, is a result of a lack uh, of, uh, of alternatives, right? Uh, especially young people have, have no idea that for them uh, the social media and their own uh, social life uh, is one and the same and it, it cannot be uh, separated. There's no way. Uh, and so this is also a, a problem uh, if we try to mobilize and, and point at the importance of uh, autonomous independent um, uh, initiatives, right? Because the first thing we're going to say, no, you have to say goodbye to your uh, entire social life. Well, that's, that's a no-go. Uh, that's not going to happen. I just want to say something about what you have just pointed out. I, I do think that the main issue is not with technology. The main issue is with imagination. This is a key word because we do have, as Gert just brought up, uh, this community has enough culture and technical skills to imagine alternative platforms. So if we have enough cultural skills, why are not we doing it? Because the problem is not with technology. We do have alternatives, technologically speaking, but the, our problem, our boundaries right now are, are here with our imagination. We struggle to imagine another world. I do remember very, so many years ago, unfortunately, that it was, uh, you know, with the Porto Alegre social forum, the slogan was, another world is possible. And that movement was amazing just because it opened up uh, to something which, which we are lacking right now, which is a possibility of our own imagination. We are, do, we are boycotting ourselves. This is, I think, the key issue also with the tech and politics. Why is the left not there, not keeping up with the alt-right? 
It's not because the left cannot use technology, because the problem doesn't lie with technology. Technology should be a solution to a world that we should be able to imagine with our imagination. So another world should be possible, but the solution should not be found uh, in technology. Should, we should start to imagine other worlds, first of all, with more joy. Because that's the thing that, uh, I mean, I, I, I teach at university, I speak with a lot of millennials. What they reproach to us is like the lack of, what, what is the world that we are offering them here in Europe? Austerity. Today I was fascinated by this uh, presentation with the Berliner Gazette, the, pro the, the project that they are launching, which is called More World, you know? Instead, Europe is playing this, what they call it, less world politics, uh, which means uh, a life of you know, deprivation, a life of austerity, a life of limits. We have to limit ourselves. This is wh what our politicians tell us, you know, even in the left, uh, unfortunately. But the problem starts exactly there. The new generation, they do not want, they want to imagine another world. They, wor they want more world not less words. So the problem lies with imagination, I think. Okay. Um, I just want to field some questions from the audience. Is there anyone out there who has questions? There's two microphones up here, three microphones. Um, please make your way to the microphones if you have a question. Yeah, thank you for this panel. Um, I'm sensing an error, though, and I want to point this out. Um, Simu, you started at the beginning talking about something that was lacking from a perspective of how our high-tech infrastructures are plundering uh, other people's lives and, and, and uh, ge geopolitical territories um, and resources to maintain this high-tech infrastructure. And then I hear that we need to expand on our open source culture, we need to expand on this alternative AI, we need to e expand some alternative networking, and maybe we need more social, physical social space in our cities. I was at the um, effective space session today, and there's a, uh, like one of the guests is a, uh, 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 the CEO of a co-working uh, Rent24, which is displacing a 40-year-old social center here in, uh, in Schöneberg. And it's like maybe if, if, as Donatella was saying, we went from more global to local and thought about what we could build for the local spaces that we connect with, we would need less digital. We would need less uh, networking ourselves through machines. So I think we, should, we need to fight for land. I think we need to fight for housing. I think we need to fight for free space that has nothing to do with technology. For me, the key, like technology with everything else, is to think about degrowth. No? So for me, it's not to go back to the caves and you no, know, like reject what technology or IT infrastructures. The thing is the scale. We don't need to have 10 devices. We don't need obsolescence uh, program, obsolescence and all this kind of stuff. But I think that has to do also with uh, the demands from the public. I don't need, I, I'm very happy if I can have one phone for 20 years. You know? So I think the the way of uh, thinking and approaching many of these abuse of, um, uh, of natural resources has to do with resource in a higher uh, level. Well, um, it's really difficult to talk about um, um, not just our process because it's not a solution. Just our, it's not the solution but we can't just uh, de-technologize or something like this, you know. Uh, we were still having uh, submarine cables and we're still having satellite infrastructure. Uh, it's more about uh, how can we construct this to about more words, you know, uh, naming things to they, uh, 
become visible enough to not need any more all of these questions, all of these issues we are talking about, uh, bringing a more open source uh, culture is not about uh, making open source apps for putting Play Store, it would be a controversy. But it's also about uh, how can we build open source initiatives on which people can appropriate themselves to make their own technologies and not technology from others or by others or whatever. So it's really much more about how do we construct new cultures of uh, naming things out to become visible, especially the invisible things that harms us, the actually making out of more warfare or technological warfare in some way. I'd like to recall, uh, speaking about this, uh, this question that you raised, I, I like to recall a slogan that I heard in this uh, hair, the, the local neighborhood uh, school of data, of relational data. Their slogan is, you don't need to leave Facebook, you need to leave your house. You know, so the problem, again, I think it's a very clever slogan because it points out to the very core of the problem. We are too much focusing on the platforms. Oh, let's stay, no, let's leave, no, let's not build another one. No, no, we need to do something with our bodies. But technology should help us, so we should not have this looted kind of behavior. We should not destroy technology. Technology should serve us, but we should do something with our bodies first. So, yeah, no, don't leave Facebook, but leave your house. Okay. Yes, good things. Can I say something? Yep. I think it's really good news because we, we have time now to do something. I mean, we are really in an optimistic phase now because we have, I think, three or four more years to really change something. So if we now stop CO2, for example, we can still save the klima. I mean, it's really good news. After all this bad news, we have good news because finally the information is trickling down. So well, you know, it's only about action. We now must just do it. Are there any other questions to the panelists? Or yeah. I was just wondering, one of the things you were saying is about how we have to really work on imagination. Is there a way of encouraging this imagination, starting off this inspiration? How can we actually begin to get to that point? Because I see, I see the problem, like we're all kind of stuck in this, everything is bigger than us, what can we do to start this off? So how can we start thinking in that kind of way to defeat that almost? For me, uh, th this is a great um, big question. It's very difficult to answer, but I want to say, let's start from uh, the lesson uh, taught by Mark Fisher. First of all, read Mark Fisher and learn, yeah, learn how to disimagine capitalism, for example. So first of all, let's learn how to disimagine. Let's learn that capitalism is not like an ontology. It's historically determined, yes, Marx, and then from there we can start. You know, it's the, actually the same experiment I witnessed at the local data uh, school in the neighborhood in San Lorenzo. They first of all, the first exercise they do with the crowd of shopkeepers of students is let's disimagine the way in which uh, we think data because everybody thinks data. I do think data as an extractivism thing, you know. So I, I have myself to learn how to disimagine data in this way. I have to learn how to imagine data in a relational way, relational way, which is very difficult. So I want to say that first of all, yes, we, we treasure what Mark Fisher has taught us by disimagining the status quo, and then we try to go to the next level. And we should do this as a collectivity, not as individuals, you know. So do reading groups, do workshops, uh, go to the squats, uh, you know, create chaos, but be together. Yes, that's the most important thing, you know. So don't read Mark Fisher alone, reading groups, yeah. <laughs> I heard 
that art is also very good for imagination. Do you have any ideas on that? Yes. Yeah. In, this, in these uh, areas? Art. Yeah. Uh, every act of creativity and of course art, yes, but again should not be, if for me, you know, the recipe is that everything, including art, should be uh, thought about as a collective gesture. You know, we are also too much uh, uh, focused on art as like the creation of an enlightened individual, inspired genius, you know, that should then expose his, his or her work somewhere, you know, in a fancy place. No, we have also to disimagine art, you know. I mean, art as a, as a collective endeavor, not as an individualistic gesture. Otherwise, we don't get out from this, uh, you know, bubble that we have built. I... Um, uh, hello? Yeah, maybe we need a Hans Hake of uh, Open Data, who kind of uh, maps the property relations. I think it would be very much helpful when you mention Creative Commons and free, free software and Eric Damon, uh, Eric Raymond in one lecture to show the differences between these different narratives. And in Germany we have the, comp, uh, open, um, the, the Wikimedia Foundation here uh, sitting in, from Germany. They are kind of uh, responsible for the Wikidata project. The Wikidata project is uh, providing structured, uh, structured condensate, condensed data of the whole Wikidata corpus. And that pipeline goes directly to Google. And Google, the, the value of that, the, not just the use value, the, 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 the surplus value of that uh, pipeline is much more than what Google gives back to, to Wikimedia. So I think um, these, these kind of uh, under, underpinnings of the, 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 the value exchange between the commons and uh, the pro proprietary system, so to say, Facebook, are not mapped out enough by artists and the narratives. And, and we, are, we know about the property regimes, but we don't know enough about um, how much we are already uh, kind of sold out through, for example, the, the narrative of Creative Commons, who kind of took up the idea of uh, free software, applied it to content, and invented the, 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 the genius ugly duckling of the non-commercial licenses which were not accepted by open, to the open data movement and now we have a total neoliberal regime uh, running open data through the neo-capitalist or Elon Musk and so on who kind of gives now the free patents uh, to, to kind of disrupt capital uh, in a disruptive capitalist manner to you know give an impulse in his direction so I think um, maybe artists can also reflect their own history of the you know, net art history and so on. And, and we think it was our, well, on this same stage was Tim O'Reilly speaking with, um, with, uh, er, with um, uh, Richard Starman. Yeah? And, and they were totally opposite sides. Yeah? And uh, maybe there needs to be more dissensus productively and out of that imagination can blossom out of conflict. <laughs> Uh, regarding the, I'm going to abuse, someone wants to talk? Or if not, I will abuse that I have the microphone. <laughs> um, no, regarding this thing of imagination, it actually surprised me a lot, this kind of question. Because for me, it's like, imagine the life that you want to live. Imagine that there is no restrictions. And this, uh, put together with many people, brings all these possibilities. That's what we did in the free software community. Everything was possible. Now we see all these infrastructures, we were building them, no? It's said that there is no autonomous infrastructures. Still, 20 years later, 15 or more uh, autonomous servers are there, no? Precarious, five people behind. I will not say that everything is perfect, but they are still there because they, somehow you believe that is part of your life and also in the squares when we came together one of the things is like we want everything we are not having demands we don't want that this change we don't know the government to change this law we want to change everything and that was what was guiding us in 2011 in many of the squares around the world i think it has evolved in the same situation and it has brought a lot of imagination to things that we could not imagine 
no? Like in, I will talk <laughs> about Spain because it's the case I know best. Nobody could imagine that you could put a banker like the former uh, president of the IMF into prison by citizens. Who the hell can imagine this guy that is there, no, president of the IMF. I mean, it's not just a neighborhood organization, no? And he's in person. He's really looking really bad. So, uh, everything, like, why, no? Like, what kind of world do, do we want to live in without thinking in these restrictions that Noradela was saying, no? They are trying to put us, ah, no, this, it has to happen like this, no? The municipalisms and fearless cities are an, uh, happening as an approach to new ways of uh, politics. We don't know. Yes, everything is. Uh, yes, everything is difficult. Everything is. But there are many kinds of tries, no? And I think we are seeing all this, all the product of all this impulse of uh, what the squares in many of the places. Uh, were happening, no? So for me, it's like imagine your own life as you wanted to live it. Or are you happy? Or are we happy? Maybe we're all very happy. And then we don't need to change anything. But I think first we have to change our way of living and ourselves. I just wanted to do a quick intervention <laughs> about this year of taking the microphone and, and it's not criticism, but actually it's a culture. Uh, and maybe uh, disimagining and unlearning uh, the way we were imposed to live with information, with taking our vices, being online or offline, uh, is also a question of uh, becoming silent for a moment. And also, uh, not only start to enjoy the silence in some way, but uh, stretching the, this time together, stretching the times we are building together in a way that it could be easier to take out our anxiety zone, uh, vociferate and talk about all we, we have in mind. Uh, which is that uh, most of these platforms imposes us to, to be, but even before that, um, the sense of being in public and also to take a public uh, say about something is also about uh, taking priority on, um, and also not pri only priority, but also uh, a sense of truth in this information we are sharing. So maybe uh, reimagining re this takes also to actually stop, take a brief, and take minutes of silence and actually think. Actually, not that we are we aren't doing thinking all of the time, but perceiving this think this this thoughts like uh, we are thinking all of the time. We are making synapses all of the time, but we don't take time to perceive that. So it's also take a deep breath and not in a self holistic way, but also take a breath from uh, all this pressure to actually make out uh, what he really we want to do differently. Can I? Um, yeah, uh, before uh, you know, we, we're going into this uh, question of the imagination, which I think is a, is a crucial one because uh, th that's where um, the question really becomes: you know, what do we have? Uh, what do we have? What do we desire? What do we have to uh, offer? There is uh, the urgent question of uh, you know um, an alt right um, uh, spreading really, and uh, because of the the lack uh, of uh, initiative on our side, uh, it's really um, spreading urgently uh, now. Um, there is the uh, European election coming up um, in, um, in, in May, um, and we need to uh, think also, we need to not just only act politically, but remember that uh, the technological imaginations that we have, they, they are directly linked 
uh, to political uh, configurations. And uh, the, the example we, uh, we are using in our text is the Five Star Movement in, uh, in Italy. Remember, that is a Web 2.0 movement that started from uh, the movement of blogging, right? And these were, these were just uh, first one blog and then many bloggers, and they, uh, they used this aggregation. And, um, uh, and, and 10 years later, uh, this same movement is uh, in, in government and um, um, is making horrific uh, and, and historical uh, uh, mistakes and decisions. Um, and so, so um, today, uh, these things, we need to uh, see that they are absolutely uh, linked. And uh, this is why we, we call in our piece um, for for technology and and people who who want um, alternative politics to really really uh, come come together because we need to understand uh, that uh, especially now and even more so in the future these two things cannot be separate and um, if we don't uh, of course we can um, you know also have a good laugh about it why not let let's uh, let's open up these alternative workshops for 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 memes do do think think about memes in yeah in a in a different uh, in a different way like uh, the group uh, cluster duck uh, who was here uh, um, uh, at the festival uh, is doing, and there are more more groups in, in Europe who uh, who say no, we we can't leave that space, uh, you know, to to the old right. This is not uh, acceptable. We need to intervene uh, now, and um, uh, you know, another meme is possible. Yes, uh, let's uh, <laughs> let's design it and um, uh, spread it. Yeah. Let's do imagination workshops. Yeah, my proposal is that we do imagination workshops on all levels. Okay, I think it is time to wrap it up. Okay, so then I think <laughs> turning to Daphne. No, just very quickly because it's late. I would like to warmly thank Carolina, Nanda, Donatella, Hert, and Sumo for this closing discussion, and also very much thank all of you for being here and attending Transmediale 2019. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you.